Let's put the time of death as assessed by Dr. Phillips on the timeline. The assessment of the time of the murder given by Dr. Phillips and yourself, Watson, 4.30 a.m. We left the station at 6 o'clock and it took us 20 minutes to arrive at Hanbury Street. Our arrival at the scene occurred at around 6.20. Given the distance separating the two locations, we can deduce that the corpse wasn't discovered after 6 o'clock and therefore that the murder must have been committed before. Now, for the most important part, the testimony of Miss Long. She claims to have seen a woman speaking to a man near 29 Hanbury Street sometime around... What time, Watson? Let us assume, therefore, that Miss Long's testimony is, as is most certainly the case, true. She places her meeting with the victim at around 5.30, claiming to have heard a clock chime on the half hour at the moment when she enters the street. Now, let's put the Richardson's arrival and departure times on the timeline. Now, let's put the Richardson's arrival and departure times on the timeline.
Despite the great respect I have for Dr. Phillips and the value I place on our friendship, my deepest conviction is that both of you are mistaken and that Richardson is in the right and that these two testaments put down in writing have real worth. But how? Explain yourself, Holmes. Remember how you assessed the time of death? You touched the fingers and body of the victim, but it was remarkably cold for this time of year. In addition, the corpse had been drained of bodily fluids. Its heat retention was therefore no longer the same as that of an intact corpse. Egad! You're right, Holmes. Oh, I've had some time to research, Watson. Given these facts, my first diagnosis may have been off by half an hour, perhaps even an hour. Thus, we can confirm Richardson's statement and establish that the murder was committed after 4.50 a.m. and not before 4.30 a.m. Our next witness is Albert Kadosh. Albert Kadosh goes down into his garden at approximately 5.20 and on re-entering his home, hears voices in number 29's garden. Let's place this symbol that represents Kadosh on the timeline. Kadosh goes back down into his garden approximately four minutes after having left it and hears the sound of an impact against the wooden fence. Let's place this symbol that represents Kadosh on the timeline. Kadosh leaves the garden, enters his house, then leaves for work, seeing the clock on the Spitalfields church showing 5.32. Excellent, Watson. All our people are now in place. Yes, but Holmes, Miss Long, claims to have seen the victim at around 5.30. But according to Kadosh, someone, most certainly the victim and her murderer, was already in the garden at 5.30. Excellent observation, Watson. It must be noted, however, that these two witnesses, Long and Kadosh, saw the time shown on the clocks in the area, which are often inaccurate and went by their empirical and, in this case, erroneous estimate of how much time had passed. Thus, neither of these two times can be considered reliable. Do you mean to say that these two testimonies might match? Indeed. Let's put Miss Long's meeting with the victim at two minutes before 5.30. Let's add Miss Long's meeting with the victim at two minutes before 5.30 a.m. Mr. Kadosh claims to, have passed by, claims to have passed by the Spitalfields Church at 5.32, which, given the distance from 27 Hanbury Street, would mean he was still at home at 5.31. Let's therefore put the end of his testimony at 5.31. Miss Long heard the man say to the victim, Will you... To which the victim responded, Yes, which would suggest that an agreement was reached and that the transaction was imminent. They then proceeded to enter the garden, which puts the voices heard by Kadosh at 5.29. We had thought that Kadosh had left 27 Hanbury Street at 5.31 after having heard an impact against the fence. Thus, two minutes passed between the moment when Kadosh entered the house after having been in the garden the first time and the moment when he returns to go out again and leave for work. How long did he estimate this interval to be? Three to four minutes. In light of all this, Watson, we can finally establish the time of Chapman's murder. Now, place the knife at the exact time.
Now then, taking into account that the local clock isn't exact and that a young man was off by a minute or two in his estimations of his comings and goings, we can confirm Miss Long's testimony and place the time of the crime at approximately 5.30. But in that case, Holmes, the man that Miss Long saw is none other than... That's right, Watson. It was the Whitechapel killer. To think that Miss Long and Kadosh were only a few feet away from him. Indeed, Watson. Had Miss Long passed just a little closer to the victim and her assassin, or had the young Kadosh popped his head over the fence out of curiosity, the killer would most certainly already be behind bars. That's some stroke of luck he had there. I couldn't agree more, Watson. But his luck didn't end there, given the mutilations inflicted upon this poor woman. What must be considered, above all, is the killer's obvious wish to remove one and only one specific organ. His surgery pinpointed the exact spot, avoiding superfluous incisions. This suggests the man possesses at least a minimal anatomical knowledge. Are you suggesting a, a doctor or a butcher? Perhaps, but the possibilities are still too broad to conclude with any certainty. Now for the motive. Despite my almost complete lack of practical experience on the subject, I have a rather precise idea of the usefulness of a uterus and a vagina. Nonetheless, once they are separated from their usual envelope, I am more circumspect as to the uses one can make of them. What do you think, Watson? We need a board, Watson. it was intended as a study specimen. I have little faith in that theory. Hardly anything was taken from the Bucks Row victim. Money, quite simply. Even if this motive seems incongruous, we're in no position to deny or affirm it until we know whether a market for human organs exists. Black magic? Watson, this line of investigation is far too vague. We don't have a single clue in support of such a motive. We can eliminate this hypothesis. Holmes, what if it was cannibalism? Even if the idea is unbearable, uh, we can't ignore it as a possibility. A desire for some sort of morbid trophy? I'd be inclined to dismiss this motive. If this were the case, why would nothing have been removed from the Bucks Row victim? Elementary. What emerges from these possible motives for having removed the uterus from the second victim is that they implied that the killer could have carried out the same thing on the Bucks Row victim, yet didn't. This brings us to a terrible conclusion. Our killer has evolved in the space of only a few days, and if that's the case, had he already struck before the first murder to which we attribute him? And if the killer strikes again, what atrocity awaits his next victim? We have to stop him, Holmes. We shall do our best. This recent business of jar filled with formalin and of the American doctor might be a lead. Watson, inquire among medical circles to ascertain if there is a black market for human organs. The chances are slim, but this must be pursued. Very well. What about you, Holmes? I will send word to Inspector Abiline regarding our recent conclusions. I should also like to become a gas man and pay a visit to Bluto at the Wasp's Nest. Understood, Holmes. I think one of my old university colleagues who works at the London Hospital will be able to help me. I shall write him a note at once. He should be able to see me during the day. Afterwards, shall we meet here? Yes, Watson. See you later and good luck. I must get to the London Hospital where my old university colleague works. To the London Hospital, quick. My colleague agreed to meet me here in one of the London hospital rooms reserved for students. Ah, John, you're there already. Punctual as always. Tell me, you don't seem to be in good shape. Is it possible that your recent marriage is making you this morose? Ah, you know me well, Andrew. No, it's a strange and terrible affair that concerns me. 
Have you read my note? Yes, I admit that I was surprised. It just so happens that I too was asking questions about our morgue. What do you think? Have you heard of any organ trafficking within? No, no, John. No doubt there exists some exchange between colleagues. Not quite legal, of course, but nothing that can qualify as trafficking. Since the Anatomy Act of 1832, which permitted the use of unclaimed corpses for science, the black market trade was definitely halted. There are sufficient subjects available for all practitioners and students. Of this, I can confirm. Well, organ trafficking as a lucrative trade is out of the question. Then what is troubling you with the morgue? You are talking about trafficking organs. But I suspect there is trade in whole bodies. What do you mean to say? Whole bodies are disappearing? Well, it's confidential, but I know of your discretion and your friendship with the famous Sherlock Holmes. I can tell you that a few corpses have recently disappeared from the hospital morgue. Cadavers that were intended for dissection. That is to say, not claimed, poor, unknown people. If a single corpse had disappeared, it might have been a bad joke. There are many students who pass through here. It's even a meeting spot. For the majority, they are here to work. A few come here in secret to practice. It also happens that instruments or organs go missing. Nothing alarming, but so many corpses. It's very troubling. But the hospital doctors aren't doing anything? No. That is to say, they would prefer not to call the police at this point. An investigation would no doubt result in the suspension of authorizations for the use of unclaimed corpses. Do you think that you could intercede on our behalf with Sherlock Holmes to clear up this situation? Which corpses are missing? Ah, I don't know exactly, but I can make an exact list if you would like to wait here for a few minutes. Feel free to look around the room while you wait. It'll bring back memories. Thank you, Andrew. It's here that students come to carry out their experiments. This surgical instrument resembles a screwdriver. How amusing. It might come in handy. I will return it later. It's here that students come to carry out their experiments. This wheel won't roll despite all of the added grease. Curious, as Holmes would say. These wheel trolleys are very handy for laying out surgical instruments. This rag is full of grease. It certainly wasn't used for a dissection. Was someone doing some mechanical work here? The last lesson must have been about the human heart. And for a class of beginners, I expect, as this diagram is rather rudimentary. It's here that students come to carry out their experiments. There is a heart in this jar. Based on its colouring, it hasn't been there long. And it looks like the drawing on the board. This jar contains two lids with combination locks. An encyclopedia of anatomy. A page on the human heart is dog-eared. Let's see.
There is a heart in this jar. Based on its colouring, it hasn't been there long. And it looks like the drawing on the board. This jar contains two lids with combination locks. A message. I'll be... Why the devil was it hidden here? An old prescription. Poor child, so young, yet terminally ill. Strange, someone scrawled something. Part of it is in Latin. These are instructions, it would seem. There is a heart in this jar. This jar contains two... Look, there was a bit of paper stuck between the two lids. Incredible! Someone has hidden a magnet in this heart. But to what end? Incredible! There is a magnet with a hook behind this pane of glass. I am in need of something. Incredible! There is a... I am in need of something. There, all done. Holmes couldn't have done better himself. A hole? I could make out something inside, but how to get it out? I will need a hook. I found it! Hmm, a coded message. I do believe I will need Holmes. Here is the list, John. The missing corpses are those of a woman 40 years old, beginning of August, another 55 years old, two weeks ago, and recently a young woman, 
These corpses had nothing in common except that they didn't have any apparent lesions. All of this is very troubling. Well, I think that I have all of the information possible, and I promise that I will do what I can to clear up this business. I must leave you, my friend, and... In the name of our friendship, please, don't cause a stare. To be sure. Thanks again, Andrew. It is I who must thank you, John. Don't forget to keep me up to date and say hello to your charming wife for me. Count on me, Andrew. I must go to the wasp's nest to find this rogue that Watson dubbed Bluto. He may be able to provide information on Dr. Tumblety. This lead, although tenuous, is well worth following. I must return to Whitechapel, but it would be better if I did so incognito.